All right, class. First off, as always, good day. I'm glad you're here. So today's class, we're going to be looking at like major battles and the first used in battles and things like that. So important battles that happened during World War One. OK. So here is your warm up picture. Now, the picture on your left, you see that black and white one. That's an aerial view of a trench. So you remember those worksheets that you should have got um, earlier this week? That's basically how it looked like from the air. You know, so you can see clearly where the soldiers in the back area were, you know, to get to the front. You can see the area of the trenches and things like that. So, and the picture to the right is the aerial view of how it, that area looks still to this day. Now, here's my question. See, you can, you know, you can see the, the colored picture. That's today. That's how it looks like right now. Um, it's saved for historical, you know, significance, historical um, uh, usage and things like that for people to see like, hey, this is where trenches were and things like that. This is how these guys live like, you know, so they basically let, let it be. But my question to you is this, because places like France and Britain and things like that, you know, they're getting crowded. So, in your opinion, should they keep this land the way it is for historical purposes so people from future generations can actually see for themselves, like, hey, this is what life was like for these guys. And they imagine living and crouched down in this type of area for so long and things like that. Or should they basically level it, you know, for houses and... um businesses and things like that you know use it for factories you know you use it for farmland you know so instead of just leaving that land there to sit in there having no purpose besides historical significance do you think that land should be used or do you think no 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 future generations should be able to have a chance to see this for themselves and see how life was for these soldiers during world war one okay so tell me what do you think what do you believe should it be saved or should that land be used uh, for different purposes? Okay, so think about it. Write your response because we're moving on in three, two, one. So the very first battle of World War I happened on August 23rd, 1914, called the Battle of Mons. Okay, so basically 75,000 British soldiers went against 150,000 German soldiers and the British were basically overrun. Okay. So the Germans had twice as many soldiers and they, they won that battle quickly going over the British soldiers. Okay. Now the first major battle, the first one that had like real significance happened three days later. Uh, this is the battle of Tenenberg. Okay. Basically the Russian troops attacked German troops. Now here's where, the Russians messed up. And this is where future um, uh, future armies and countries learn from the mistakes made by the Russians. What happened was the Russians got on the radio and basically said, hey, we're going to move our troops to this side. Make sure this regiment on near this town moves this way. The thing is, the messages were not encrypted. It was basically like you talking on the radio. The thing is, they didn't think the Germans were listening and the Germans were. And so the Germans are, hey, they're going to this town. You know, we got some troops down there. Have them set up, fortify, get in position. So when these guys come in, we can set up an ambush and bam, get them. And that's exactly what happened. Um, they knew, they changed their strategy to go around what they knew what the Russians were doing. And they ended up killing 30,000 Russians and capturing 90,000. So already in the first three days of the World War I, the Germans are coming out strong. Okay. Now, it's because of this that the first battle of Marne happens. Uh, it's a six-day battle. And basically the Germans were, you know, feeling good, riding the tide. Heck yeah, we're... We're kicking butt and taking names. They decide to charge France hard. I mean, they're bull, they bulldog through right through the front lines. They're busting through. And their goal is to get to Paris. 
because if they can get to Paris, that could really hurt France quite a bit. And they could knock them out of the game quite easily, you know, and, and early off in the war. But what happened is the French army basically came back and bam, pushed them. So if you look at this map, see where that red line is? Okay. The Germans got to where that dash line, they got that close to Paris. So you see that dash line? That's where as far as they got, but then the French army pushed them back to that where that red line is. Okay. Now, that's good for France. They felt like, heck yeah, we, we pushed these Germans back. We showed them. We gave them a good clock in the face. But here's the problem. Where that red line and where that kind of greenish, grayish, purplish, whatever line color that is, where it says Belgium and separated between France, in that area, between that line and where the red line is, where the France section, there was a lot of factories there. And those factories were crucial in helping make weapons and things like that for the, Brit the French army. Now they're under the German control. So the French army had to rely on factories on the other side, which really couldn't do the same job or, as, or wasn't manufactured to do the jobs like those other factories were next to, um, that were down in control of the Germans. So this kind of hurt their army a little bit. Now, the first battle of press was an interesting one. It's called the race to the sea because basically what happened was the um, the Allies, the Germans, they realized, oh, dang, the uh, Belgian coastline, which basically if you get to that area, you have access to the English Canal. You have access to the North Sea. They're like, nobody's there. So both sides are trying to get to that area as soon as they can. And uh, 600,000 German and 420,000 Allied forces fight for like three weeks. And they're trying to get to that point. All of a sudden they see each other and they start fighting and they start going at it, right? Um, both sides lose a lot of men, a lot of men. And this is the time where they start realizing we need to dig trenches. We need to set up where, you know, draw the, the line in the sand type of thing. So both sides decide basically do that. They dig a trench. Boom, boom, boom. Here's a line. This is where we're at. We're looking at the Germans, making sure they don't, they don't advance. If they try, we're going to shoot them down. Um, and this is the time where neither side really gained any advantage. And this is a foreshadowing of how war is going to be in the future. You know, it's not going to be like how it was back in the day where you charged and then you took this land. No, now we're digging holes in the ground and we're watching you. You're watching us. If anyone tries to advance, the other side's going to attack. So to gain territory, to gain land, it's very difficult during this time. And again, this is just the very first time they use the trenches and it's basically how war is going to be for here on out. Okay. Now the battle of Verdun, this is the longest battle, single battle in world war one. It basically lasted for almost a year. I think I believe it was like 11 months. Um, in total, about 600,000 soldiers die from both sides, the central powers and the allies. Um, Germany basically tried to take France, um, try to take this one fort specifically to try to crumble France. Because again, they got really close to Paris. Now they're, they're like, hey, we struck fear in them. Now let's really get them. And that's what they try to do. It's all psychological warfare as well as regular warfare and so they're trying to get them to uh, buckle and things like that but the thing is the um, germans could only do that for so long because again the trench lines stop you have you can't really advance because you're going to get mowed down by the other side and so this is the time when then the french actually regained some of their land they started attacking uh and relentlessly you know, so they gained some of the land, but then winter came and winter in Europe is very cold. It's, you know, it's, it's, it's crippling, especially when you're out in the elements, you know, they, they couldn't put up tents because again, those tents are going to get shot up. 
they had to build barracks inside the dirt and it's cold, you know? Um, so what happened was as the winter came, there was like, Hey, we need soldiers over here. There's another big battle happening over here. So a lot of soldiers left, you know, that area to fight in the other battle. They did leave like a skeleton crew. So basically a minimum amount of soldiers that can occupy that area to make sure the other side doesn't attack. You know, small enough group that can handle, you know, the other side, whatever they throw at them. And both sides did that. Both sides only had a skeleton crew. And these guys were just sitting there day after day watching, you know, like, should we attack? Should we not? Are they going to attack us? Or are they not? Things like that. So, again, this one battle lasted for almost a whole year. All right. Then comes the Battle of Gallipoli. Okay. Um. The thing is, this is the first major beach landing that was done. Now, the French and British decided, you know, they're going to take the fight to the Ottoman Empire. Because the Ottoman was way down here. You know, France and all Britain, they're all up here. So they decided, you know, we're going to take the fight to them. And that's what they did. And the Ottoman Empire is in is nowadays modern-day Turkey. Okay. Now, what happened was they decided to take control of the sea route and try to take this one crucial town called Constantinople. Now, if you if you have if you can remember this, you have a great memory. But we talked about this in the past that Constantinople was meant to be the hub of the trading world at that back in the day. Okay, and it did remain that way for a really, really, really long time. A lot of people from a lot of co different countries went to Constantinople. Because it's like the midway point to Europe and in Africa and the Middle East and Asia. It was just a perfect area for all of those people to come and meet like halfway in a sense. And so the French and British realized this is a key place. We need to take control of this. And so they did. And hundred it cost the lives of 180,000 soldiers. And here's another one too. Some people forget about this, but Australia. They had soldiers in the war. Now, Australia was in control, being controlled by France, uh, France by, by England. But the thing is, there were Australian soldiers in World War One, and they kind of get forgot about. You know, same thing with like Canada. People forget Canada sent soldiers too. Okay. Now, the Battle of Somme. This is the first, um, the first day of it is considered the bloodiest day. Uh, the bloodiest like one day battle thing of World War One, okay? Uh, <laughs> it was bad. Twenty thousand British soldiers died, and another thirty-seven thousand were wounded. Now, this is the first time that tanks were truly used during the war, okay? And by the end of the whole battle, which was like five six months, um. More than a million people had died. Okay. Now, again, these tanks were not like how they are nowadays. They are not the best. You know, they did break down, things like that. But on flat, on, in the trenches, it was pretty bad because sometimes they would fall into the trenches or you know, sometimes they would turn and get stuck and fall in. But in flat desert land, they can, they can go, you know. And with cannons on the sides and things like that, yeah, they, they were uh, a formidable weapon. Now, it's around this time that America, people are looking towards America going, when is America going to join and things like that? America's like, no, no, this is your guys' thing. This is Europe's thing. You know, Britain, France, you know, Germany, Austria, Hungary, you know, you guys are fighting this thing. This has nothing to do with us. Now. If you guys want to borrow money, things like that, we'll gladly help you out. And that's what they did. America lent money to both sides. But here's the thing. Our government was already kind of leaning towards one side. And how did they do this? They basically limited Germany. Told them, hey, man, we can only lend you about like a like million dollars. Yeah, you know, sorry. you know, But if you pay us back, we'll lend you more. But... That's, that's our limit right now. Sorry, man. 
Whereas with Britain and France, they basically said, how much you guys need? $5 million? No problem. $10 million? Sure. They didn't put much of a limit on Britain and France, but Germany they did. Now, it's at this time, too, that Britain decided to kind of create a blockade um, in the North Sea area to stop uh, boats and submarines from docking in uh, Germany and Belgium. Okay, because they wanted to stop any type of contraband, any type of supplies going into Germany, whether it's guns, ammunition, or whatever. So Germany decided, you know what, we got pretty good boats too, especially our submarines. You know, so they knew Britain, Britain's an island. You know, France is basically torn up because of the, the fighting. You know, a lot of their farmlands is being destroyed, things like that. Um, their factories are basically destroyed, being taken over, a lot of them. So they knew that Britain and France needed support from America. They knew that they got their food, their supplies, equipment, things like that from America and other countries. So basically what they did, was that their plan was this. They're going to surround basically Britain and France. And they let... Other people know in, in February 1915, if you bring a ship towards Britain or France, we're going to sink you, okay? This is your warning, okay? Don't expect any warning when you guys are out in the sea. This is your warning right now. Stay away from these two countries. Now, in May 7th, 1915, a German U-boat saw this British passenger ship called the Lusitania. And they had some intel, and they decided to shoot at the passenger ship. And when the passenger ship got hit by the torpedo, it sank quick. I mean, it just went, just basically went down. Very few people were able to get on lifeboats and get off. You know, this wasn't like the Titanic where it slowly went down the bow first and things like that. No, this thing went shut down quick, fast, and in a hurry. Um... And there was a lot of people outraged with it. They're like, why could you? There was people on that, on that boat. It was a passenger ship. You know, 128 Americans were on that boat. How, oh, how dare these Germans shoot at them? And Germany basically said, okay, two things. One, we told you guys, don't send any ships that way. That was a British passenger ship. We told you guys. Two, our intel says there was guns, ammunition. There was things like that in that ship. To help the British. So we shot it down. Now, America and Britain for years said, nah, nah, there, there, there's no ammunition. That was just a passenger ship. You know, these uh, Germans just wanted to sink the boat. And we find out, <laughs> like in the 1980s, that it's true. The Germans were right. There were there was bullets, gunpowder, ammunition. In the Lusitania. That's why it exploded the way they exploded. And that's why it sank so quickly. Because there was um, ammunition in the bottom of the ship. So when it that torpedo hit it and exploded, it exploded the rest of the, uh, of the ammunition. Okay. Now, that's not, they won't know that until about another like 70 years. Okay. So at the time, Germans were looked on as bad people, horrible people, attacking people. It didn't help their cause anymore than when in uh, March 1916, a French passenger ship called the Suez was attacked by the Germans. And that's the bottom picture you see of it. Um, it got destroyed. Okay. It got destroyed pretty bad. Okay. And Americans got hurt on that explosion as well. So Germany was like, oh, man, we're ticking off the Americans too much. They're neutral. They're not taking either side. But we're doing things that can, is really ticking them off. So they basically told the allies, okay, tell you what. We promise not to attack ships without warning. So in other words, we see a ship coming. We're going to pop up from the water. We're going to tell them, hey, stop your ship. We're going to inspect it. Or we're just going to tell you to turn around. Okay, we won't attack you, but if you don't listen, 
or if we find ammunition and, or supplies on that ship, we're going to tell you to go away or we're going to sink you. Okay, so but we're going to announce ourselves first. All right, so here's my question to you. Now, here's your scenario. You are in control of 5,000 soldiers, so you have a brigade, okay? You guys have won two major battles, and now the enemy you're fighting against, they're retreating. They're leaving, okay? Your men are tired, but you know with these guys running away, you can get them and either capture them or completely destroy them, okay? But here's the kicker. They go into a part of a country your side hasn't explored yet. So you don't know this town. You don't know this area. You know. So what do you do? Now, I've had students in the past. Well, how many soldiers does the other side have? You don't know that either. You just know they're running away. And that they're, they've lost two battles. They're running scared. And they go into an area. That your place hasn't explored yet. So what do you do? Now again, remember, this is the 19, you know, 16, 1917. So there's no satellites. There's no GPS. You know, um, maps, if you're lucky, they might be available. They probably aren't. Because again, it's a war zone. Okay. So what do you do? Do you go after them? Do you wait? Do you send scouts? I mean, what, what would you do? What to you is the smart thing to do in this course of action? And why do you feel that way is smarter? Okay. Do you just go head on? Hey, let's keep going. Forget them. Forget whatever. We got them on the run. Keep getting after them. You know, so what do you do? Okay. So think like a real commander, you know. Think like, hey, you got these five people's lives are in your hands. Okay, this is wartime. What do you do? Okay, so once you finish this question, you're done with this lesson. Okay, so hopefully you learned something new. Hopefully you enjoyed it. Um, so if you're in class, don't forget, get your vocab done, all six words. And uh, don't forget to research. Okay, so be sure you get that done. Okay. If you haven't finished the trench paper, the trench worksheet, be sure you get that done. Okay. So with that being said, you guys, you take care, you be safe, and I'll see you guys later. Okay.